mode. Hello and welcome to the second webinar in the three webinar series on getting started with barcode based digital data collection for vegetable breeding programs by Michael Mazurek. In these webinars, you will learn user friendly ways to set up your breeding or trial program with a barcode based system. The first webinar uh, was presented in late August and it was recorded and it's available at the link on your screen. This is your host, Alice Formiga, and I host webinars for two communities that are part of eExtension at extension.org, eOrganic and Plant Breeding and Genomics. This is a Plant Breeding and Genomics webinar, and you can find many other recorded webinars and articles on plant breeding in the webinar archive at the link on your screen, as well as on the Plant Breeding and Genomics YouTube channel. This webinar will be recorded and we have also uploaded a handout of the slides, which you can find in the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel. We've also uploaded a barcode ruler. Well, actually that was in the last webinar and had a link to the last webinar. So I take that back. We don't have a barcode ruler this time. Um, this presentation will last about 45 minutes and then we'll have time for questions. If you have a question, feel free to type it into the question box and hit return. If you don't see the question box open, click on the little plus sign or arrow next to the word question and that should open it up. We'll be reading as many questions out loud as we can after the presentation is over. Our presenter, Michael Mazurek, is the Calvin Noyes Kinney Associate Professor in Plant Breeding and Genetics at Cornell University. His breeding program focuses on the improvement of vegetable crops for organic production systems, as well as identifying genes and developing tools to facilitate vegetable breeding progress. So Michael, thank you for joining us again today. And I am going to hand over the screen controls to you. So you should now have control. Thank you, Alice. And thank you everybody for uh, joining us today for part two. So this is the, the second part of three. Just a reminder, the first part was an overview. I'll refer back to things we described then. Muted. Some of the, the systems to uh, start to look at in terms of budgets and maybe what to buy the components and some of the backgrounds of a barcode. Um, Today, we'll be looking at things we use between going from sewing uh, into the field observations and uh, show you kind of behind the scenes some of our workflow. And then the third webinar that will be uh, September 28th to wrap everything together, we'll have some more goodies, some more uh, things you can take away from that in terms of uh, some of the little apps we have or modifications to really help facilitate, expedite all the process. Um, and today we'll have a little bit of code uh, to share as well. So here, um, thinking again about all the things you would want to do in terms of being able to identify all the seedlings that you are starting in your propagation house or direct seeding uh, in the field. For us, we have many transplants and the bark facilitate that. So how do we get those uh, stakes printed and made and what considerations do we have? What have we learned? Um, some things are very practical, like as uh, you go through and if the seedlings need a spray and you have a horticultural oil or you're using just a, an oil, like a stylet oil, um, key thing is uh, it will not dissolve these, but it will moisten the ink. And if people go through and test it with their fingers to see if it smudges, yes, it will uh, until it dries. Um, um, but otherwise, it's a very uh, robust system, uh, works well for us. And then as we go into the field and you start to see things, um, beyond some notes they're used to taking on a clipboard, how do we be able to take everything uh, that's in this plot and be able to recall it? Uh, and so looking at everything from ways to uh, quickly take some of the standard notes you might be taking about this plot, looking at you know some uh, opinions you might have about the fruit yield of this orange pumpkin, the powdery mildew coverage on the leaves, um, and if you want just to be able to refer to your whole season at once and overhead photos of the plot. So from the beginning, right, so sort of chronological order, um, thinking about getting ready to start sowing seed for transplants in the greenhouse. We talked about this system last time, but the key thing here is we have uh, a standard spreadsheet we use for our planting plants. 
And we always start with a plot number. And so here the plots, it's uh, our consistent system. So we have it's 2017 plot 101. We have a previous number column where we have the seed uh, packet we source this from. So in 2016, this plot, this plant, that's where the seed came from. If we need to trace it back to the exact packet, if there's issues with cross-contamination, uh, maybe a pollination wasn't a true self, uh, maybe there's some genetic variation, it's not fully inbred yet, going back to the plant can be really important. We have the pedigree uh, as a separate column, uh, and then the generation. It's a little redundant, but you'll see why that's handy in a minute. Um, and also we have this kind of simple notation, the quick summary that is essentially the plots here, um, but without the year designation. Um, and as I go to the stake, you'll see where that comes in. Um, uh, uh, the way we facilitate that, uh, simple uh, spreadsheet, uh, copy paste, but as we paste this column over, um, we can just highlight this column for the simple category, do a replace all, do 17 dash, and then just type absolutely nothing in the box uh, to replace it. Uh, and so they effectively just deletes that 17 dash. Note, uh, if I went to do that from any other column, uh, the, the dash isn't unique. And so, so here we have a 17 dash. Uh, and so if I were to do that in any other column, uh, please be aware um, they won't work um, as well because it will remove 17 dash and we'll end up with 16 dash 32, which isn't what we meant to express at all. And then how that translates to a stake um, is that simple column that's kind of how we want to be able to quickly refer to something in the field is here on the top. It's vertical, uh, so you're not going through everything with your uh, head leaning on your shoulder bent 90 degrees to read everything. Where there's more detail, we need some more real estate. Uh, the pedigree and the barcode we do vertically so they can really stretch out the length of the stake. And we often put the generation um, below as well. And then what that looks like uh, is I can, as you walk through the field, and big bold characters there and we know it's 2017 uh, when we're going through the field in 2017 we don't need that uh, so this 101 here is easy to see uh, the pedigree if we want to refer to it um, and double check it's an f3 is kind of wondering what generation we're in as we have different series and different plots and then the barcode we can scan in and for those um, that uh, it's always a uh, concern is always uh, how do I know that what that says, uh, it automatically from the same text box in, or cell in the spreadsheet is pulling off this 17-101 here. That's a human readable version uh, and exactly what is in the barcode here. So if the barcode has an issue, you can read that. And also later as we're harvesting, uh, we can't just write you know 101 on everything, have those labels. Um, this is when you start to need to have like the full year and plot as you have programs that hopefully uh, go on for many years, um, knowing which year is critical. And so this is our basic setup. Um, things to watch as you set this up and you know, send this to the printer. Um, you know, often these will uh, come flying out of the printer, at about 10 stakes per second coming off in the spool. Um, so you really want to check things before you hit go or do a little test batch. So you want to check the longest names you have here because otherwise something that happens even uh, though we're conscious of it is you have some of these that uh, have a word wrap happen and it goes on to a second or third line and that will cover up your barcode and can make it uh, impossible but usually just a little trickier to read with some of this covered up. Um, the barcodes, an interesting challenge we've had but figured out is that um, as you add more characters, it'll be more dense and at some point it'll get a little too fine to read robustly in the field. And the you have jumps in sizes. And so if I decided this was, was a little too in the program, it's just like a text box. So I could grab down here at the bottom, pull down and drag down. Oops. 
<laughs> Click that. Um, and in doing that, it will jump to another size. So depending on the resolution of the printer, it will have larger or smaller jumps. We went with a little bit higher resolution printer now, just so we have a little bit more control and we can adjust the size of the barcode a little better. You'll also notice we're using the code 128 uh, one-dimensional barcode. Um, it's something that just works a little better for us, as we talked about in the last webinar. Uh, and even if you're not using barcodes, just getting these uh, these printouts are going to make sure you always know what number something is without any uh, questionable characters um, and writer's cramp as we go through you know, thousands of these stakes a year. It's just nice to have them printed out, put in the pots, and there's more information if you can print it out versus if you have to write it. And so as we generate these, uh, we have a, a dedicated stake label printer. Some of them are multi-use. You can also use it for barcode stickers and labels. Um, we've gone with a 23 mil plastic stake. There's various thicknesses. Uh, you can get some very thin, almost paper-like stakes. Um, and we have just found that a thicker stake is a little bit more like the plastic pot labels would normally use in the greenhouse. Uh, and it's just easier to stick into soil, uh, et cetera. And we have liked a size that's three quarter of an inch wide and five inches long. Um, when picking the lengths and also picking your printer, there'll be different printers that can handle different length stakes and vice versa. So um, that's something we need to match up and decide as you go, you know, keeping in mind that some of this will be lost in the soil. At the w last webinar, we'll also have a list of all the things we buy and kind of where we find them and some of the, the pricing we've been able to find, some of the model numbers that we're actually using. So hopefully that's something that lets people just you know, make this a very portable system into their programs if they wish. Um, as you want to Google around and Google around and search and find some other um uh examples and maybe some better deals or something that fits you better than we've found the key thing is these aren't you know label stakes horticultural pot labels or horticultural labels that is the key words to opening up all of these resources as you search um, and we get these in rolls of about 2000 there's one here that goes right into the printer um, and pricing wise using a moderate amount uh, per year uh, they cost us about two cents per stake uh, you also need a thermal transfer ribbon. Uh, so this comes in a roll it's right here um, and those are a quarter of a mile long several more uh, longer than the stakes and so you can do a few rolls of stakes per roll of these um, and so the price is about a tenth of that of the stakes um, and they do have to go together You're actually transferring the ink on the thermal head of the printer onto the stake the printers the ones that we're using uh, is the most expensive part uh, of this. Uh, this is about $3,300. And sometimes we are printing, you know, the morning of just in time um, as we have people busy sewing. Uh, one of the things we have to keep in mind with our budgets is, you know, the hourly rate, fringe indirects of all those people. And so trying to be able to use that labor as most efficiently as we can is important. So we are often, uh, if we have more time of the day, we'll print up some more stakes and keep going. Um, if you have a different sort of program where you are able to anticipate a little bit more ahead with all you need, uh, you can also uh, seek out a number of printing services where you can send them your spreadsheet and then they will print up your stakes and send them to you and you can avoid um, the infrastructure cost of the printer. Uh, also, there's a number of different ways to label the flats. Um, uh, also, putting stickers on the flats themselves. The stickers stick really well on, on plastic, and so that works well. And the styrofoam speedling trays, uh, not, as, not as well for us. And some of the, the value in having um, that uh, label, uh, the barcode right there, even beyond just the number on the stake, is that as you go through the greenhouse and stuff is starting to germinate, 
you can quickly make some observations of what's going on and it makes it very easy to record it. Um, as we have the stakes, we can scan in the barcode um, and be able to note. Uh, on the left here, we have a couple flats with some very uneven germination and some albino seedlings that might be a, a concern, might be a recessive trait or something we wanna make sure to watch in this population, maybe purge it, maybe start some more seeds. Um, and the other example, Example on the right is some squash uh, seedlings coming up, uh, two in the center with um, some very virus-like symptoms. And so to make a note and to check that, um, scanning it in is a great way to just have that all digitally right there with you. Um, the other advantage we have is when we're in our prime seed sowing mode, we're doing so many uh, flats filling greenhouse after greenhouse uh, in our case and our seed room is about half a mile from the propagation greenhouse and so as we have some people still you know, pulling seeds getting them ready to plant uh, succession and crops uh, being able to just scan in everything that's not working well and email it, text it to the person in the seed room and say, hey, can you uh, grab some more of these seeds is just way more efficient than writing something down and heading back over. Um, another uh, thing we do, and this is maybe a, a departure a little bit from the um, that seed uh, digital aspects, but I guess it is in a way because as we pull the seed packets we're going to plant, since they all have a barcode on them themselves, uh, to make the planting plan and to enter in everything really well so we know which seed packet it came from. Scanning them in is uh, way faster than typing. Um, and we always are, as we take seed out of a packet, we'll put the new number uh, on the back. And so this is an internal control. So if I want to go back to this packet because of some uh, good or poor feature we need to follow up on about the plants, having that number on the back is a great internal control to just confirm, yes, it was uh, taken from that packet. Uh, also, as we go to plant, we'll pull them into a new packet, and when we do that, we'll put the number we need to sow in there. Uh, so it's a little bit of extra work, but it also protects our very valuable seed stocks, some of which will go into our climate-controlled seed storage uh, for decades afterwards from being in the greenhouse and getting uh, cross-contaminated with wet uh, potting soil, uh, coated fingers reaching in, or you know, potentially any uh, watering or roof leak mishap. So keeping that seed really pure and clean is important. So one of the steps we do. Okay, so after everything is up and you're ready to go to the field, um, we have tried out a couple different stakes. In the end, we use a mix of both. And so I wanted to show you the, the two we've hit on. Um, the first are some wooden stakes. Many people uh, I know use these. We use the ones that's the 12 inches long, inch and an inch wide, uh, and the color-coded ones so we can really see them easily in the field. What we like about these is they're short, so they fit under the row cover, under the cultivation equipment. And as we're transplanting, just to make sure every Everything is lined up, nothing gets off uh, between uh, packet to flat to field. We can actually pull the stake right out of the flat and we have these plier staplers. We can just staple it right to this wooden stake as we're putting it in the field. And so as we're taking the transplants out, their stake is uh, like you might just transfer it to the field anyway, is just secured here on this stake. The plier staplers go right through the plastic of the stake and the wooden of the backer stake. Um, the downside is they are uh, 20 cents each and start to fail after about three months and starts to rot off right the soil line. Uh, you can bust them off, stick them back in as we did for this row number one here. As you can see, it's shorter and shorter uh, throughout the season as it kind of rots away and we stand it back up. Um, so, you know, that's the, the downside of them is they just don't last very long. The alternative um, and what we really enjoy right now, uh, you can see it right next to this orange wooden stake. We have this much taller 32 inch wire stake with this plastic card on the top and some corrugated plastic, the same as people might have 
have for different signs to put up in their lawn that's the the same system um, so we just buy these from a horticultural supplier um, so a variety of heights we get the 32 inches tall ones um, these are much uh, add up much more quickly uh, than those popsicle uh, stick stakes um, so a thousand of them which is what we easily use any given season um, that weighs about 400 pounds so the storage and transport of these uh, you know is something where uh, you have to plan ahead a little bit more than just uh, those wooden stakes uh, the things we love about them is they stand up above the crop they stand up above weeds uh, and as you're walking by you need to scan this in you're not bending down and doing a deep knee bend lunge at every every plot to scan in the the, the little orange stake uh, you're actually scanning it off at a much more ergonomic height stickers uh, adhere very well um, and so these last the whole season no problem for us um, and you can apply a sticker over the sticker the plastic card tops last three years um, the metal wire uh, depending on how you take care of it lasts easily several years it's a little bit more expensive uh, up front but I think it works out better in the long run the metal is a buck fifty each and the plastic card tops are 20 cents a piece in the last a couple of years the same as uh, the wooden stakes but we never spend any time looking for the plot label it's always right up there uh, easy to see and if you need it <laughs> much higher you, know, you can go up to a four foot tall stake a few inches will be in the ground but it's quite tall uh, we love these a lot as you go through and need to scan those in, uh, I won't spend much time on it here, we talked about it the last time, um, is looking at the type of scanner you're going to use. Um, we love these handheld ones, but you have choices, Bluetooth, USB, uh, all in one, uh, in 1D or 2D. Uh, we recommend in general, people look at the 2D imager both barcodes and it's really a lot faster uh, to capture the image and to make sure you aim it well okay. so some of the systems we use um, uh, as we go through the the field and do some data collection the one we started with um, we can see we have all the operating systems represented here um, so and Android tablet with a 1D barcode scanner. This was the, the cheapest system we started in. Now with some of the full function spreadsheet programs available on Android and also here on the Apple iPad, um, there's a lot more functionality for us. The downside still is they don't have a keyboard for rapid data entry, but you have your barcode scanner, so it doesn't matter so much. Um, this one is a couple hundred bucks, a one dimensional one, and it's Bluetooth connected to this device. Um, we also went to a 2D, uh, kind of rugged outdoor uh, barcode scanner. This was, uh, quite a bit pricier uh, and we were here it's paired up to an iPad and that was working quite well for us um, when it rains and you're out there waterproof cases for these are now available um, but our favorite um, almost used exclusively in the field is all-in-one scanner it has uh, the laser uh, out the front to scan things in, has some very ergonomic buttons here and on the side, so it's quite nice to work with. Uh, you can choose it with a number keypad uh, like this one or an alphabet keypad. Um, these can be expensive to purchase new, about $1,500. Refurbished ones from the manufacturer, the same sources. I looked online the other day and it was a, a couple hundred bucks uh, to be able to get a refurbished one. So the same price as this new little scanner. Um, it also has a stylus, touch screen, on-screen keyboard. You can use that in addition to this very quick entry number pad. Uh, we, one of the main reasons we like this is it's both the ergonomics of it and you don't have to worry anything with a, out people uh, needing to ask about how to pair the Bluetooth and other challenges and which device is paired to which device and making sure they go to the field and sets. This is just very simple. 
So as you're scanning in the barcode data and using that to, in place of a keyboard, to populate your spreadsheets, uh, after you enter data in one cell, you have to move on to the next, not just overwrite it. Um, so to be able to do that, you can advance to the next column or row uh, automatically. There's a series of codes uh, the scanner comes in comes with and the simple instructions just to do in the, the programming mode, scan what you want to do and end program. And now your scanner at the end will transmit a tab character across the screen or an entry character to move down the screen. We use the enter uh, most often when we're doing those planting plans and just scanning in all the seed packets and want to go down the rows. Um, the all-in-ones, there's a setting within the scanner software that does that. Uh, and critically, depending on how many people you have out there doing this, you can also set the volume of the beep uh, so it doesn't have um, that kind of grocery store uh, checkout line beep vibe going on out in the field. Uh, you can mute that. Still getting some feedback, you've got a good scan, uh, but it doesn't need to be that loud. Also, in these instruction sheets would be important when you go to scan uh, or pair your Bluetooth scanner. Uh, it'll tell you to enter this Bluetooth code to be able to pair it. Uh, you'll notice there's no keypad on the scanner. So you just scan a series of numbers that have their barcodes. Uh, you can print one out if you don't still have the instructions with you. And, but that's how you can enter the number to be able to pair it successfully. Beyond the tab and to being to go from column to column as you look at a plot and here have some example information we might want to add about stand count architecture, leaf type, disease resistance, etc. When you get to the last column, uh, it'd be great to be able to reset back to the beginning so you can start on the fresh plot and have that happen automatically. So you're just scanning away as fast as you can and the program is taking care of everything else. Um, there's some ways to do this with how you sort the data when you're done, uh, but you can do it right in the field if you're using um, one of these uh, regular versions of a spreadsheet program, um, and we'll show how to do it uh, next and some little code you can take and try in your own uh, spreadsheets. Um, whereas we have five columns here, and we'd really like it to just drop down one uh, row and go back over four columns back to the fresh row. Okay. So how to do this and how to get a, a good old fashioned carriage return back um, is if you go to your software program and you right click on the tab uh, at the bottom, the same way you go to rename the the sheet in your uh, spreadsheet here. Uh, instead of doing rename, if you click view code, it opens up a new window and I've provided the code here that you can paste into it to have an automated carriage return function. The key thing um, is we sell the number of columns and then, which in our case was five, we want to drop down one row and since we have five columns, we'd like it to back up four columns to go back to the first one. So what happens is after the scanner inputs a value into the fifth column, the cursor moves down one, left four, ready to go. Uh, and so it's just an expeditious way um, as you can slide, to be able to enter in everything. And as soon as the data for uh, this last observation for the plot is entered, um, the scanner, the spreadsheet on it like hops back right to this next cell. It makes it really efficient. Okay. Um, the last bit, and one of the, one of the pictures I started with, the overhead photo, uh, mentioned this a little bit in the first webinar. We'll be looking at how we do some of the mug shots of harvested fruit uh, next um, in the last webinar, but using a Wi-Fi camera. So here, Emily has this window washer pole uh, from the hardware store with a simple quarter inch, 20 threads per inch bolt through the end that's the same as a camera mount. Um, so at the end, she has a small digital camera. Uh, you don't want a big camera here, it'll get quite heavy. Um, and most cameras now uh, have a Wi-Fi capability. So you can use your tablet, smartphone, maybe an old phone you're not using anymore. Maybe you're gonna upgrade in a couple months and you're still gonna hold on for that old one, which isn't great, but uh, still maybe functions well enough to uh, just use it as a Wi-Fi device and be able to 
connect to the camera. And you're basically going to use this as the shutter control for the camera. Uh, so on the screen of the phone, you can view uh, what the camera is going to take a picture of, adjust the focus if need be, and just press the button and that will remotely uh, fire the camera, you know, just like a, a selfie stick, only the extra long version. Uh, as you're out in the field, uh, also consider a battery backup uh, as you're going along snapping photos, uh, having everything die and have to recharge is a drag. Uh, so getting a spare battery, a car charger, um, and for the, the phone or other device, the portable batteries you can plug right in with a USB. Uh, very handy to have just so you can keep going and finish something all in one day, same lighting, etc. So in this, uh, we refer to a lot of these repetitive overhead shots as you know the the mug shots. Um, they're not these uh, custom composed photos where just the lighting and composition for each one. We're going to crank through um, a thousand plots in the fall, maybe five thousand fruit coming into the lab, and so just getting one setting that is not going to change, so we can compare across all the photos, all the differences in lighting and the camera adjusting and trying different doing different things automatically that maybe we don't want so one consistent view right so one of the key things uh is the the scary thing for many of switching the new automatic all uh everything solved for you automatic digital camera back into manual mode um say so if you're not mode or even if you are in manual mode the key thing on uh, sometimes will let you leave in auto mode is to be able to switch it from a multiple sampling to a spot sampling mode so here on this camera here you can see we're in the settings or the metering mode and the default is this averaging so it looks at the whole composition the black plastic the weeds the dirt the uh, white plastic, if you're in the south, reflective mulches are especially tricky. And just looks at the light and everything across that whole image uh, and comes up with an average. Often you don't want that, you want the plant you're focused on. So here in the metering, you go from this multi-metering average mode to a spot where it's just going to look at the plant that probably in this case uh, is exactly dead center, or close to dead center in the image. So it's going to look at that. So even if you leave it in automatic mode, just that change will make a world of difference. Okay. Um, the next thing uh, is setting the white balance. Uh, if you're in the greenhouse and you have the mix of sodium and metal halide lights, uh, metal halide especially, you might notice that all of your photos have a kind of a creamed spinach green overtone. Uh, so there's easy ways to, to compensate for that. Uh, you can turn the lights off, use a natural light. Um, in many cases you can't so how do you get a true color and not something that's a, a color that when you look at the photo you, you know that's not the color you saw so there's a lot of preset mode so here on the back of this camera we're in the white balance mode here there's wb uh, and there's a bunch of settings for daylight here where it's on cloudy if you're in the shade uh taking the photos uh different lighting modes but also there's these custom ones so these two triangles and the square over it and this camera happens to have quite a few custom modes um so after you go into white balance mode uh, to be able to get a custom white balance, you get some of this pure white. There's some photographic cards you can buy that are pure white. Uh, if you have some notebook paper, you get a few sheets. Uh, so it's just a really pure white. We go to the, the home improvement store and buy this product called a milk board panel. It's like a white plastic fiberglass. So it's really cheap and we can have a lot of it around. Um, but you simply go into white balance mode custom. Uh, the cameras will vary, but essentially you take a picture of the pure white object and the camera knows whatever light it's seeing to compensate that to pure white. And then every photo you take will be set for that lighting. And so uh, if you go inside or outside, uh, you have to make sure to change that back, but it's a very great way to get the pure color as you intended. Okay. Next step is aperture and 
shutters. Again, things that people don't deal with much on a camera, but here's an easy way to get back to it. Key thing uh, is aperture is the depth of field. How much of your plant is in focus? Uh, if you're going to take a close-up of a large fruit, if we're going to do a close-up photo of a pumpkin, um, it's the difference between whether the face, the front part of the pumpkin is in focus, or the whole pumpkin we can see is in focus. Um, shutter speed, we usually do secondarily, the only, uh, just to react to it, to get the right exposure. Uh, this is typically, we just adjust the shutter speed as reaction to that, or if it's a breezy day, if the photographer, uh, especially on that long window washer pole, it's a little unsteady, um, the shutter speed can help get rid of any blurriness from the motion. So in the, shut, in the aperture, um, the uh, how it works is uh, large, uh, smaller apertures, a larger number, and it's kind of the bottom of a fraction. They allow less light in and have a greater depth of field. And so, if you wanted to have everything you see in focus, a very large number like f8 to f16 will do that. And if you're going to take an overhead photo of a tall plant, you have a tomato plot, and you want it in focus, top to bottom, a small uh, a small aperture, this large number, will do that for you. Um, if uh, it's getting dark and you need more light and uh, want to go with a faster shutter speed, um, a larger aperture will let in more light. So this would be a smaller number. So like an f2.8 uh, through 4 is good. As we're doing squash plants that are vines on the ground, there's a very uh, narrow depth that needs to be in focus there. Um, and so a way to uh, remember which is which is if you've gotten gone to the eye doctor and gotten the drops in your eye, your pupils get very large, you're very sensitive to light, uh, and you have trouble focusing on anything except it's like right here, just a couple of uh, feet from your face, uh, well, you have a large aperture then. Uh, so that's a way to remember how that works. Right? And then shutter speed is in reaction. So where to start? And if you just start blindly, you might be sorting through a lot of different options and really finding your way unproductively getting frustrated. So the key thing uh, for us is making sure in that spot metering mode, so we're not taking in the color of the black plastic mulch and using that to uh, uh, gauge our photo, but really focusing on the plant. If you switch to that mode and press the shutter down partway, uh, looking at the plant, or you can buy these gray cards as kind of neutrally brown gray object, at least if you don't have that, uh, we've used the, some of the compost can gray lid that you haven't had the gray card, the camera will display these exposure settings that are really just neutral. It's not looking at something that's all black, like the black plastic, and thinking it's night and trying to brighten everything. It's not seeing the white plastic and thinking it's so bright and you end up with a black shadow in place of the plant. Um, but you'll get the, the two settings. You'll get uh, your f-stop and shutter speed, and then you simply, simply turn the dial to manual mode, enter those settings, and if you take a test photo, it's probably all set. Uh, and you can always adjust that as necessary. Um, so uh, if it's too dark, you can make the shutter speed slower. Um, if it's too light, you make the shutter speed faster. Uh, and if the whole plant isn't in focus and you're struggling, the key thing is uh, being able to go into that other mode uh, many people have never used before. Uh, you see this A on the camera dial, this aperture priority. This is where you can control the aperture you want. You can say, okay, I need to get this whole thing in focus. I need a smaller aperture. I'm going to go from an F4 to an F8. Uh, look to see, is everything in focus? Great. Press the button, uh, and it will display the shutter speed that's kind of auto exposure. Um, and then you can go into manual mode and enter in all these settings and then take a really nice photo. Um, so with all that, uh, I think you have the same the setup we have to be able to go out to the transplant house with the seed packets and have an automated stake printout. Uh, you can then uh, take transfer those to the field and be able to collect all your observations digitally uh, in the field. Um, and then also go through and take some plot photos to document uh, what you saw and have something that's just a really great 
resource uh, to document the season. In the third webinar that will be coming up September 28th, you'll see what we do post-harvest, how we label and tag everything coming in, some more code we use that's really easy to implement. You don't have to be a programmer to use uh, to be able to Unmuted. get some stuff done quickly. Um, and then everything from bricks, dry matter, how we have all that automated uh, there in the back room. And so I'd like to thank uh, Lindsay, Sarah, and Emily that helped us pioneer uh, things that we have adapted from the Buckler Group, uh, Alice for hosting this, and a big thanks to the USDA uh, National Institute of Food and Agriculture's AFRI program uh, for funding this as we've bred new squash and been able to explore these ways to be able to uh, collect our data more efficiently. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Um, we're going to have some time for questions now. So if you have a question about any of this, you can just type it into the question box and hit return. And I just want to remind everyone that this talk is being recorded and it will be available in the next week on the Plant Breeding and Genomics YouTube channel and in the webinar archive. And I'll pull up that link in just a second. Um, I'll start reading the questions. Um, we have a question about whether it's easy to change data after it's been entered. So if you accidentally selected lobed but you meant unlobed what would you do hmm. yeah um, so you are really just using the barcode scanner um, in place of the keyboard um, it's very easy uh, if I'll just see if I can go back a few to the uh, some of the examples here this is a place to talk from so as you are getting some of this data in and whoops got the wrong leaf type um, with the PDA there's a little stylus there you can use your finger you simply tap back on that cell the same way you might do it with your mouse uh, if you were typing the data in and then scan again it will overwrite that data um, and if you have some of the scanners um, if we go back and I'll show you some of these so here's a stylus you can just tap on the cell that will display on the screen it's all in one there um, this scanner in particular is a little hard to see here but you have a plus and a minus button so if you scan the wrong thing you can this one you can simply hit the minus button it's an undo like a backspace it will go back remove that and you can re-enter the the right data or you can you know uh, tap the screen uh, and go to that cell and rescan it. So both options really accessible there. Uh, and we've gone with these. There's the other function many of these scanners have is maybe what the person's thinking about is uh, especially this little black one, it has onboard memory. And so you can go out with it in the field uh, all alone uh, and without being able to see really what it's doing. And you can spend all day scanning observations, collecting data, um, and um, it will store everything on board and then you download it at the end of the day. Um, and that was just who, uh, not enough uh, of us being able to snoop on what it was doing and you know maybe change your mind. So things exactly like this question. So you want just something to make sure it has a, a screen where you're following along. Other people also will just uh, use their smartphone uh, and be scanning it right into a spreadsheet or something there, uh, setting the phone to vibrate so you can scan and when you feel the buzz in your pocket, uh, you know you've entered something. We like to see the data going in um, and, and with both our hands are full and uh, with this one, it's just one uh, simple PDA strapped onto your wrist. Great question. Okay. Um, someone suggested that it would be nice if you had some video to see you actually doing this in uh, real time. Um, do you think you're going to make okay. anything like that? Um, sure. Yeah, I would be. Uh, yeah, I'd be very glad to put that together. Um, uh, we'll have uh, uh, it be compiled. We can we do this with the the final collection of materials for this, Alice? Sure. Just have the yeah, videos of it. Totally. Yeah, we could easily yeah. upload a video with the archived recordings and yeah, make it yeah. a package. Yeah, that would be great. Good idea. Yep. Thank and, you. Yep. And hopefully we'll have it done for the the twenty eighth. So if okay. you join us, then uh, hopefully we'll be able to have that also to Alice by then. Wonderful. Okay. Um, okay, we have a couple questions about plot photos. So how mm -hmm. do you connect the plot photos with the barcode 
plot data? Yeah, it's a great question. So I'll go back a couple more. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll take a photo of this plot label um, and then the overhead photo of the plot. So it is uh, moving the camera back and forth. Um, if everything is all in sequence, uh, you can also just do that at the beginning of the row and then do the 20 plots or so in sequence and then take a, a photo just as we like to do as an internal control to make sure we're not off by one. Um, if you then have the imager scanners, um, you can make this very large on the screen uh, and highlight the cell of the, the name of the photo and scan this in and it'll automatically label the photo that way. Um, and I know some other people have some automated ways to be able to take the plot plan and the photos and automatically rename them. I think the Buckler group uh, was doing that. Um, we have a little bit more kind of hands-on approach. Okay, uh, so this is kind of a related question. How do you find back which plants or plots are on a specific picture? Yeah, yep. And so we're we're typically, you know, start, uh, we'll have uh, a, one population or one experiment. Uh, we'll take the photos in order. Um, and, you know, and then if you do have to do some retakes, if you don't like one and you don't delete it, um, being able to see, oh, that's duplicates and hitting the confirmation of when you're on to the next row or on to the next series after you do 25 of them. Uh, that's an important, a very important thing um, that we are always kind of taking pictures. And I think you'll see quite a few of my colleagues also have the, the system of picture of the stake, plot photo. Um, and we, we do do that internal control. Um, later you see when we do the, the fruit photos um, and the post harvest um, is really easy to be able to scan in. Uh, we'll include this sticker as an internal control. We've worked in some different ways to have um, a dry erase board or something to drop down in the plot to also include as an internal control and we just haven't found a quick way to do that yet. Okay, um, at this point we don't have questions yet um, anymore, but uh, if you do have a question, this is a great opportunity to ask Michael directly. So I'm just going to leave another minute or so in case there's anybody else who has a burning question. Don't be shy. You can just type it right in. And meanwhile, I'll pull up, put up the link to the archive here. Um, if you just Google the Plant Breeding and Genomics YouTube channel, you can easily find that as well. And the previous webinar from um, late August is up there and the others will be there too. But we hope you can also join us on September 28th. So I'm just going to leave this for one more half a minute or so just in case anyone else. Here we go. Yes. Um, do you have ever any issues with the glare from the sun on the handheld scanner screens? Um, we don't. Um, you know, and we're in, in Ithaca, so if you are uh, down in southern Arizona, it's very likely a different sun. Um, these are all devices meant to go outdoors, um, and so the um, some of the the tablets, like the Android, Apple, um, you might use a Microsoft tablet. Um, those, um, if you've used them outdoors, I mean that's what you're going to see. Um, the outdoor tablets, um, we tried some of the other ruggedized tablets, but like these scanners, you can see them just fine. It's much better than your laptop screen, which, you know, if you've tried to work outside on a sunny lunch break, you know it's frustrating. Um, but these are uh, much easier, and you, you're not needing to look at them so much uh, and double-check everything, but you can see it just fine in our experience. Okay, great. Well, I think that's it for the questions then. Um, but I'd like to thank everyone who asked questions and thank you again, Michael, for giving this webinar. And we hope everyone can join us back um, for the next webinar. And um, okay, thanks for, for joining us, everyone. Thank you.